Hey, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome. Faces are slowly trickling in. Yay. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Gus. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> oh, so many people. Some familiar faces, some new faces. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hello. <laughs> so fun. If you'd like to introduce yourself into the, the chat, please do. You can leave your name and uh, maybe where you're zooming in from. And just to let everyone know, we will be recording the webinar. So you are welcome to have your camera on or off, whatever you feel most comfortable with. And um, everyone's muted at this point. And just gonna give a, um, a minute as um, folks roll in. Yep, my picture's off. Oh, there I am. There we are. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hey, Ethan zooming in from Missoula. Wow. Cindy from Santa Barbara. Sarah from Sarah. Tucson. Laura from Concord. Anna, right next door. Oh, great, great. Wow, it's so great that everybody's here. We had such an amazing turnout. So many people signed up. Okay. Well, um, I guess uh, we can start. Um, I like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dong Yi, and um, I am the program director at Quail Springs currently. Um, I've been at Quail Springs since July of 2022. And this place, I still feel like I'm new <laughs> because this place just has a way of working with time. Um, and yeah, I'm so happy to have um, Alex Prima and Ashwin Mantri Pragada today um, to yeah, share um, around, about sociocracy with y'all. Hey. Thanks, Domi. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to get hope share my screen so we can just see. Whoa, we've got too many things going on here. Just a second. There we go. Queen of the tabs. The queen of the tabs. I have a real tab problem. You should know that about me. Okay. So, as you all know, we're going to be talking about sociocracy today. And let's see, Dongyi is going to keep admitting folks. Um, I, there we go. Now you can see us. Um, as Dongyi said, I'm Alex Prima. I'm, my pronouns are she or any. And um, coming in from Ventura. Um, and Ashwin is here. Go ahead, Ashwin, if you want to say a little bit about yourself. Sure. My name is Ashwin Mantri Pragada. I use he pronouns, but I welcome others. Um, I've been at Quail Springs since 2021, uh, first as a work trader, then as, as executive director. And I am really excited to be here talking about sociocracy with you all. And I'll share also that I've, I came to live at Quail Springs in January of 2021 as the livestock director, and then transitioned with Ashwin to the position of executive director in July of 2021. And that was also the year that I completed my permaculture design um, certificate with Quail Springs. So it was a big year, very exciting. And, and this, this webinar, um, I, I'm really excited that Alex will be taking a little bit of the lead here. Uh, it's been part of her project uh, as an executive director focusing on operations and governance at Quail Springs to really refine our governance model. 
that we inherited. Um, and so I will be a little bit in the background, but popping in here and there. So I'll hand it over to Alex. Thank you. So today's webinar is gonna go for about an hour. We may go a little bit over if people have a lot of questions, but Ashwin and I will be talking for about 45 minutes about social permaculture and sociocracy at Quail Springs. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for a Q and A. Um, we, there's so much that we could talk about because uh, this is, is a long journey and there's so much to say about social permaculture. There's so much to say about sociocracy as a method and about our nonprofit. Um, so I just wanna kind of presence that of all the things that we could cover, we're just touching on a little snippet and we'll share with you what we do know, but we'll also be honest about what we don't know. So this is quite, quite a process, learning a new form of governance. Um, thanks to Sarah, who's here um, on the call with us. Um, Sarah was executive director of Quail Springs when the transition happened of our governance model, and we'll explain all of these words and, and what it all means, but um, that happened in, in early 2020, and then we've been sociocratic as an organization for three years, so that's both a long time and a really short time as far as experience goes. So I just want to say, you know, if you have a question we don't know, we'll tell you that we don't know, but we'll give the best possible answer. And um, I'm, I'm assuming that if you know us and if you know Quail Springs, then you have an idea of the work that we do, but Ashwin, maybe you can explain a little bit about what we get up to as a nonprofit. Sure. So Quail Springs is an environmental and educational nonprofit. We are land-based. We're based in the Cuyama Valley of California, which is uh, Shumash land. And it is sandwiched between Los Padres National Forest, um, Santa Barbara, Bakersfield, up in the high desert at around 3,600 feet, high elevation, high desert environment. And what we do in our work is we try to teach low cost methods of being resilient in agriculture, in water conservation, in habitat restoration, so that we can all be empowered to do that similar work either at home or in our communities. Great, thank you. Yeah, we're all we're all so honored and proud to be doing the work that we do, which is very gratifying. Okay, well, we got a lot of people here um, just to kind of tune in together. And because um, a lot of sociocracy involves talking and thinking about meetings, um, I just wonder if you can raise your physical hand or your Zoom hand. Um, how many people who are on this call attend a lot of meetings during the week or during the day? <laughs> yes, plenty of hands. And if you think about what it's like to be in those meetings, um, do you the majority of the time feel listened to and feel like there's spaciousness in those meetings? Not nearly as many hands going up, but some, yeah, that's good. Well, a lot of what sociocracy is about is increased effectiveness and increasing connection. So because a lot of us do spend time sitting in circle with each other, um, that's a real big part of what we're trying to accomplish with this governance method is that folks feel like they can really be heard and that they can have the time to feel that their voices uh, have a chance to speak and that they also have the spaciousness that, um, that they can truly listen to others. So just a little tidbit I'll say now is that as a governance method, when um, applied properly, sociocracy is meant to actually create a feeling of psychological safety because when we know that we're going to be listened to and we know we have a chance to speak, then we can really sink in and relax. So that's something that I actually really love about it. Um, because working in groups together means that those aspects of listening are so important. Um, okay, let me see how I get into. So we're gonna share a little bit just to start off about permaculture. Um, we may be using a lot of terms that folks don't know too much about. And 
Uh, permaculture, as Ashwin mentioned, is something that we teach at Quail Springs, and we are a permaculture demonstration site on the 450 acres that we live on. So one way of, of defining permaculture is that it's, and there are so many definitions that are, have been created, but it's a practice of observing patterns in the natural world and applying them to the re regeneration of social and land-based systems. And another quote that I really appreciated and wanted to share, this is from uh, Carla Maria Perez, who's a Latinx indigenous permaculturist, is um, that being a design system for creating regenerative human settlements, permaculture is a key instrument for communities in developing small scale solutions. The notion that oppressed people can draw upon ancient methods of living in balance with the environment to build resilience and regain social, political, and economic independence. So that's that's a huge aspect of permaculture and also really important aspect of social permaculture, which we'll share more about in a moment. And before we move on, I just want to say that permaculture is uh, didn't create any of the ideas that it draws from. It It's um, often um, touching on the ideas of indigenous folks and people who have lived um, deeply in cultural patterns for a long time. So nothing is, a, is, an, is an original permaculture idea. And let's see, I'll turn it over to you, Ashwin. So the beauty of permaculture is that the ideas can be distilled into three, three basic principles which are kind of these universal principles that many, many humans around the world like to orient themselves toward, which are a care for the earth, a care for people, and thinking about e equity and equality, so fair share. And I think this, this presentation today really focuses less on the question of earth care, even though all of these principles are embodied in every aspect of, of what we do as an organization, and as part of permaculture, but more on sociocracy as it relates to people care and fair share. So Alex and I were having a discussion earlier today around which of these, which of these principles is kind of highlighted in permaculture, uh, sorry, in sociocracy, which of these permaculture principles. And I sort of landed that it, it feels more like fair share and Alex felt more that it felt more like people care. And I think in some ways, it's both. Um, in many ways, it's both. Sociocracy is a, a way to help us govern ourselves. And as Alex mentioned earlier, to listen to each other so we feel that our um, we, all, we all feel that we have a say in matters that, that affect an organization's, how an organization runs or how a team does its work. And then in terms of fair share, it's about making sure that we're all equally involved. None of us are overworked. None of us are underworked. We're all accountable to each other and to our own, uh, to our to our own workloads. And so, um, thinking about how permaculture influences sociocracy is sort of at the basis of of this this presentation today. And so, if we if we dive a little bit deeper into social permaculture. Um, one of the main, a big part of social permaculture is economy. And so within the, the five pillars of economy or with it, an economy is made up of five pillars, uh, which are resources, work and labor, purpose, worldview and governance. So sociocracy will falls under governance and um, ex other examples of governance are democracy and corporate governance. Those are the two that we hear about quite often. And what permaculture is doing is supporting us to move toward a regenerative economy instead of an extractive economy. So that's moving in the direction of deep democracy, which sociocracy is considered to be. And the reason that is, is because it, it allows us to be a self-governing body. And at Quail Springs, we're, we're a small group of people on the land. We're usually between 12 and 20 people. And within the nonprofit, there's about, um, usually 11 to 15 of us. So within that small group, we have the opportunity for a lot of involvement and dynamic self-governance, which is a great practice because as a group gets larger 
um, governance gets even more challenging. So we were actually in a really ideal situation to, to get to learn and um, explore within these methods. So it's, it's like a form of direct democracy. And let me go on to the next slide. Oops. Okay. I love thinking about um, economy as uh, not always, uh, we, we relate so often to economy as based in a sort of financial paradigm, uh, but yeah, really thinking about economy in terms of our systems of equivalence and um, how do we equate time, how do we equate each other's work and labor and um, what we're offering each other. And so um, one of the one of the things that that sociocracy is based on is a sense of um, equivalence, uh, a sense of protecting the equivalence of each person and enhancing their ability to fully contribute so that each each person, whether they're a novice or uh, an expert, feels that they have equal value uh, in their input into an organization's running. So it's great for organizations like ours, especially that are small enough that want to self-govern based on the value of equality, where we really want everyone who's involved in the organization, we want their input, we want their thoughts, uh, we want uh, to see how their objections might change our, our path or their perspectives might bring us forward. So it's, it's, it's a great, it kind of works as a governance system based on consent. And Alex will describe that a little bit later, what, what we mean by consent. Um, and it's, it's one that, and I've noticed this a lot, um, being one of the executive directors now, but starting off as a work trader, which in a traditional, in a traditional environment, um, a work trader or an intern has little say in an organizational's functioning, but I was welcomed at, at so many of the meetings um, to the governance of this organization, which was a really special feeling to feel um, heard and listened and cared for. Um, so it, it's it's really about kind of an inclusive and collective intelligence. Who are we together? Who are we together as a body? So it's important to always focus on where we come from and what, um, where an idea originates historically. And um, sociocracy was created by Gerard Endenberg um, in the Netherlands in the 1980s. So it's a pretty new concept of ideas. And um, at the time of its creation, it was called the sociocratic circle method. Now it's mostly referred to as sociocracy, but you'll hear a lot of different names once you get into the world of it. And um, Gerard Endenberg was an engineer and an entrepreneur uh, who grew up going, he was born in 1933 and he grew up going to a Quaker boarding school. And often folks know about the Quakers as using consensus decision-making. Um, so it's interesting that he had this upbringing uh, based on consensus and agreement. And then uh, later on, he became the general manager of his family's um, engineering company. And that was in the mid 1960s. And then in the 1970s, he started creating a new way of, um, of applying these ideas that he had and pioneering the sociocratic method within the company, his, within his family's company. And in 1978, uh, Endenberg founded and became the director of the Soci Sociocratic Center in Netherlands and then furthered the approach of sociocracy. And it continues to develop into what we have today. I love the slide because it highlights uh, one of our favorite team members. That is the goat known as sociocracy. And I don't know if you can see, but on the side of her, um, uh, on her belly, uh, right there on the right side, it looks like a fist in the air. And <laughs> on the other side of her, which you don't see, it, it does look like, I always think it looks like a, a dollar bill. So it's almost it's it's almost like she embodies the experience of this organization, 
just uh, collective wisdom, um, not, not necessarily to fight money, but to use it wisely, um, to think about how we function uh, as uh, a human, um, human society. And sociocracy, the goat, also teaches us a little bit about uh, how deeply important within sociocratic governance relationships are. So um, if you ever come to Quail Springs, which I hope you do, one of the first goats that will greet you is likely sociocracy, and she likes to nuzzle and get to know you. Um, and I won't say that that's true of all the staff at Quail Springs. We won't nuzzle you. <laughs> but we will like to get to know you. And a, a big part of sociocracy is making sure that those relationships are strong. Um, the, the relationships are built on, and in, in sort of in the governance model is, is built on trust. So we trust each other in various, what we consider circles, um, also known, you can think of them as teams. We trust each other in various teams to carry forward uh, specific, projects or specific aspects of the organization. And the ability for us to trust a team to say, carry forward a budget or carry forward a, a redesign of the garden, um, that's based on trust. And that's based that on this feeling that, oh, that farm team can, we know that they know what they're doing and we trust them to move that forward or that, uh, um, that fundraising circle knows what they're doing. They can move that forward. Um, if you think about a traditional governance model or governance system, there's a lot of hierarchy. Um, and sociocracy isn't necessarily anti-hierarchy. It's just turning hierarchy from a model of hegemony and of power into one of um, kind of uh, sort of parallel parallel hierarchy, one where it's not about having power over someone, so a boss telling you what to do, who then has, uh, and that manager tells the next person what to do, and that person tells the next person what to do. It's less, it's less about being told what to do than making sure that what we are doing and what we're hoping to do is, is being relayed across circles effectively and efficiently in a horizontal way. So people who are traditionally seen, quote unquote, at the top of an organization, like executive directors, are not necessarily at the top in terms of power, but we do have a bird's eye view of what the organization is doing. And as such, as executive directors, we are um, kind of, uh, in, in sort of the executive circle or the fi finance and operations circle, we collect information from various circles to then put into things like a budget or um, what we are reports to the board of directors. So it, it it's it sometimes I will I will admit it's sometimes really challenging um, having grown up primarily in hierarchical traditional hierarchical structures to reorient to this kind of governance where um, many of us had various points want to just tell someone else, can you just, can you just do this? <laughs> um, can you just carry out this task? But if that's not part of a collective decision-making process, which we'll also get to shortly, um, it, you, it's, we're not actually empowered to just tell each other, do this. It, it's, it's a really new kind of experience um, that has its challenges, but once you understand, once you kind of get the hang of it, it, it is. It can run so smoothly, efficiently, and it's really exciting because we see. I, I don't know. Even in the two years that I've been at Quail Springs, I've I've seen the effectivity of it. I see how circles um, are being trusted more and more to carry out certain projects, and that trust is based on the fact that they are sharing their work at our business circle. I'll, I'll hand it over to to Alex now and. Um, she can explain a little bit what you're looking at right now. Yeah, thanks, Ashwin. That was so helpful, especially that reminder of, of unlearning, because for me as well, I grew up, um, I had bosses, I had teachers, and I was they were the respected people that I listened to, and I did what they told me. So then 
I think it can be uh, potentially destabilizing to come into an experience where there isn't just someone to ask, what do I do? Um, because even if someone might come to Ashwin and I and say, well, what do I do? Our answer may be, oh, we need to take that to the program circle, um, or we need to uh, we need to talk about that at the housing circle. So there's all this talk about circles. I'll explain a little bit more. Um, what you see here is a very, very simplified version of what our organization looks like uh, for the nonprofit element of Quail Springs. And I, I thought I would keep it simple and not get really complicated with arrows and overlaps, but um, but what you're seeing is, is basically like what Ashwin said before is different teams. So each circle represents a team. And then in the center, the business circle uh, for our organization is uh, a circle that all staff members are a part of. So we meet once a week and we do, we talk about particular things at that meeting. And so each circle is an autonomous decision-making body and each circle has its own aims and domains. Um, so the aims will cover what does that circle do? And the domain is what does that circle have authority over? Um, a really interesting way to think about this is something I learned from a participant in a course that I took about the basics of sociocracy. And another participant, her family operates sociocratically, which just blew my mind to think about, you know, they have, even the family has aims and domains and has circles. So the idea of circles is, is a way to spread power and to spread decision-making. And um, for us, each circle also has its own budget. So it also has um, autonomy in, in the way that it wants to spend money. And there's more details to that, but um, I'll give you an example. So you see the facilities and infrastructure circle. So that circle works with, um, we're a land-based nonprofit. So we have a lot of costs to upkeep the property, to make decisions about buildings and um, maintenance of those buildings and the site. And so the facilities circle has its budget and it has allotted um, categories within that budget, but the facility circle can determine on its own, say we, need, we needed parts for a flail mower recently. And within the category of, um, equipment upkeep, the facility circle can decide on its own in a meeting if it wants to spend the $400 that were needed to buy parts for that flail mower. Um, how important is that decision? They don't need to go to anyone else to ask about that. So that's just a kind of a simple example of, of a decision-making um, a decision making process. It can get more complicated and, and we'll share sort of briefly in a bit about uh, proposals for decision-making and a proposal, maybe a way to think of it is like a, um, um, a, an idea presentation that's been clearly thought out. So most of our proposals are talked about at business circle, but each circle can also, if it's having a hard time coming to a decision, can also um, create a proposal within each circle. And then I'm going to pass it to Ashwin to kind of explain a little bit more of how a decision making process might go. So. Alex, you brought up the a, a more simple version of, of a decision. Uh, then there's also complex decisions, uh, decisions that will affect more than one circle. If it just affects two circles, those two circles can team up and have, have a special breakout meeting uh, and come to a decision. But sometimes decisions affect many more than two circles, if not the whole organization. So in a recent example is at the advocacy circle, specifically regarding our water advocacy work. We, we had a, uh, a grant that came to our attention that was a pretty significant grant that I'm actually working on, working on as uh, right before this uh, and after this, after this uh, webinar. And it's, it's a significant grant that would uh, provide Quail Springs uh, a significant amount of funds from the national government, from the NRCS and the USDA to carry out a pretty big three-year long project. Now, 
that is very much within the scope of what we want to do as an as a organization focusing on water advocacy and restoration work and um, habitat restoration work. However, the advocacy circle is primarily three people. It's it's me, our watership, uh, watershed, uh, uh, watershed stewardship. It's hard hard to say. Watershed stewardship and advocacy director Brenton Kelly and our director of, of facilities um, and infrastructure Rachel Higgins, and the three of us know that the scope of the work of that grant would is much too great for three people we're going to need the whole team involved so in that case we not only had to go to fundraising circle of which i'm a part as well um to make sure that um that this is something that we can foresee as an organization the grant itself is something that we can apply for and that we can team up with other organizations to apply for but it's gonna involve the labor and the staffing of everyone. So we're gonna to need to bring this to the business circle. Um, first as a discussion, something that let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about the potential, the potential of this grant for what it could do for Quail Springs for the next three years, what it could afford Quail Springs for the next three years. Uh, how would it affect our communications? How would it affect our ability to continue the things we do on the land that we do? Um, in which ways would it support our advocacy in water, but maybe detract some of our some of our advocacy work in natural building? So all of these kind of contemplations have to come to a fore at business circle before advocacy circle, and then ultimately fundraising circle as the one that writes the grants can actually move forward with this. So that's very different than let's say a traditional hierarchical model where executive directors are pretty much the ones that decide what the organization does. And they would say, here's a grant, we're gonna apply for it. And it looks like we are we're, we're have a great chance of success for this grant. So should we be successful starting September, everyone's job descriptions are gonna change pretty drastically. And that's that, that approach just, we, it doesn't feel like it empowers each of us to be part of that process and to be excited about that process. So this this allows us to, uh, it feels sometimes like it takes a little bit more time up front, which it does, it tends to, but once a decision or once something gathers momentum as, and is uh, moving forward, it's almost unstoppable. And that's what's pretty exciting about it to me. Hmm. Nice. Unstoppability. So this is a very brief overview, but a little bit about um, how a circle works. So as I mentioned, a, a circle, we both mentioned that a circle is a, a trusted team of peers. So we, because we, everyone in the circle holds the same amount of power, there's sort of an, an inherent trust that builds. And then the circle is also an autonomous decision-making body. So we all hold the same amount of power. That said, we do need someone who's going to make sure that the meetings happen and that our agenda is ready and that we actually do what we say we're going to do. So Quail Springs actually does a simplified version of this. We establish a circle lead through a sociocratic election process. Potentially in the future, we'll establish a circle lead and a secretary um, and a facilitator. But often for us, the circle lead is also the facilitator of circle meetings. And a part of um, being elected for as a circle lead or a, a secretary is also a term. So you won't necessarily, once you, if someone is elected and they accept the election and the position, it doesn't mean that they'll do that position forever. Everyone agrees to a specific term and it may be six months, it may be a year. Um, so this also means that the rotation of circle lead can change and that other people can also have this, this similar experience of being in that role. The circle lead uh, doesn't hold any more power than anyone else. They may just put a little bit more thought into things that are happening for that circle. Um, then the circle is going to establish its aims and domains. So as I spoke about before, this is 
what the circle agrees that it's going to do and the authority that the, the authority that it has to make decisions. And this is really important. This is actually something that um, takes quite a lot of time to outline and needs really specific language. And in all honesty is something that we um, are going to be spending quite a bit of time on in the coming months at Quail Springs, because we need to do kind of a refreshed training about our aims and domains and have and revisit each circle's um, outlined aims and domains to make sure that we are uh, on the right track. And then we establish a meeting cadence. So for most of the circles at Quail Springs, we meet once a month. Uh, but as I mentioned with the business circle, which is the circle that everyone's a part of, we meet um, every Tuesday. And we basically follow the same agenda for the for every meeting. Um, and then another really important aspect is to set up double links. So I'm also going to be honest and say that this is something that we still need to do at Quail Springs. And the the importance of double links is to create a really clear feedback system so that information is traveling. If you're thinking of, of sociocracy as a parallel structure, you wanna make sure that each circle is also communicating with the other necessary circles. So basically the circle lead and an elected delegate from each circle also need to be links up to the circle that's sort of above them or it's a poor word to use, but the circle that is um, that leads uh, to um, larger larger tasks. So for every circle at Quail Springs, um, the business circle is the main circle, and then all, every other circle stems out from that. Above is actually a, it, it could be the appropriate word if we don't think about it in terms of um, <laughs> non hierarchically uh, above. Yeah, so just like a perspective, you know, it's like you. If you're above something, you kind of need to take in the information from everything below to make a decision from above, um, even, even if you're not exerting power over, over those other, um, what you're seeing below. That's true. And an example of that for us is we have a, a advocacy circle, but then we have two sub-circles. So the, the sub-circles are our water advocacy circle and our natural building advocacy circle. And they they deal with um, sort of sub aims and sub domains. Um, we could get pretty in depth here, but I just wanted to keep it pretty simple. Um, there's in sociocracy, there's a really basic structure of how circles are created and how they're set up, so that it's so that people know um, how to depend on this process and how to create a sub circle is is a standard procedure. So. Um, we don't have to make up the process as we go. That said, there is a lot of space, and this is kind of a, a cool aspect of social permaculture because every organization, every group, every, every body that decides to govern itself is going to be different and is going to have um, particular circumstances or eccentricities that are important to the way that they function. So what I've learned, the more that I, the more that I learn about sociocracy and basically the more I learn about anything in life is that often when I ask a question, the answer is it depends. Um, so there are there is a lot of room for it depends in sociocracy. And so so going on, um, just to talk briefly about consent based decision making. We, as I mentioned before, with with the Quaker religion and um, the creator of sociocracy. Quakerism is often associated with consensus decision making. And consensus decision making really focuses on agreement. Like, are we all in agreement that we can move forward? Uh, sociocracy focuses on consent based decision making. And I, I really like this perspective, but consent can require that no one disagrees. But something that's really valued in sociocracy is objections. So we, because objections really mean that people are thinking about how something is going to work, a plan or an idea. And if they have an objection, it's not based in personal preference. It means that they see that 
they're objecting and they can speak their objection because it will get in the way of the circle being able to carry out its aim. So if someone is voicing, so say I, I say to Ashwin, um, as a friend, I make a proposal <laughs> and I say, well, let's, um, you know, our aim is maybe to have the, the smoothest friendship possible and to make agreements between the two of us of how to do that. And then I say, okay, we're gonna take a trip and I've thought it through. Um, I've planned the five CDs that we're going to listen to and we're going to listen to them at the volume of 40 in my car. And Ashwin's objection may be, um, I would rather listen at the volume of 35 and I would like to also choose two CDs because your proposal gets in the way of the aim for us to both have say uh, in order to have a, a friendship that works for both of us. So once someone voices an objection, that objection becomes the objection of the entire group. It's not that one person's anymore that they need to hold and defend. It's like, okay, here we go. We're gonna work on this collaborati collaboratively as a group. And so it creates this commitment to learning and listening together. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't disagreements and that proposals can't take quite a long time, uh, but a proposal is a way in sociocracy to bring a big idea and to show that, that an idea has been thought through and then to hear how other people um, perceive that idea and what they might have to say about it. And again, like I mentioned before, there's a really clear process of how to hear a proposal, how to get feedback on a proposal and how to move forward in the proposal. Um, there's also, if this is something that we still need to um, do some training on it at Quail Springs together, but there's a really cool process called picture forming. So if a group, wants to create a proposal together, then picture forming is like a way to all meet up and come up with every possible idea that we may need to think about in that proposal and every possible solution. And then uh, a group can take that picture forming, some determined people, and then can go make like, tinker with it and make the best possible proposal, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring back to the group. Um, it's all really exciting and I, I I just want to say again that I really appreciate this, this aspect of being able to hear um, objections because so often the way that I understood <laughs> was sort of socialized to do meetings is like try to speak up as little as possible and that disagreements were not really welcomed. And if I did have a disagreement, I may have to kind of elbow my way in there and it may not go very well. But something that's really beautiful about sociocracy is that it's built this system to, um, to, to already pre-plan for that for conflict that can happen. And Alex, if I may jump in here, uh, one of the exciting things about an objection is, and as, as you had mentioned, is that it is a collective objection. So one person may have thought of it, but it is something now that we have to hold together. So any kind of objection is, is leads, it's leads toward a solution, solution based thinking. It's like, well, here's an objection. Um, I want those two CDs. I want to listen to two CDs in our trip to Zion. Uh, and I'd liked it a little lower in volume. Now we both have to kind of work that out um, as a collective objection to find a solution. And in that, so in my objection, we're both going to start to process, okay, what are some of the solutions? Either a compromise in volume, um, maybe it turns out that the CDs that I wanted to include are part of your selection of CDs and voila, we have a solution already. I mean, this is this is a trite example for some of the really challenging things that we do face in in our circles as an off grid uh, organization. There are some um, major challenges that we face uh, from policies on vehicles uh, to um, uh, what are some of the recent proposals. Um, uh, reimbursement policies, you know, reimbursement policies when 
uh, when we are thinking about how many trips do we need to take to pick up feed for the goats? And should we, should we be making sure that those trips are, um, are combined with other trips to town that we need to do? Or what if we just need that feed right away? How do we, how do we start to think about all these complexities and build in some forgiveness and build in some um, anticipatory objections or anticipatory problems through the objection yeah. process? Mm. Right, anticipatory problems. So we're, I, I just wanna note that it is 5.45 and we're, we're getting close to the end. So we'll kind of cruise through our final slides. But something I don't wanna forget to say about um, decision-making together and the proposal process is that a really great way to look at it is, um, and again, taking the personal preference out of the decisions, but can does this work for the aim of the organization or the aim of the circle? And then when we come to a decision still, if, we're, if we come to consensus, we may get there because we say, okay, well, we're gonna try this for a, a period of time and we're gonna see how it works. And then those people who may still feel uncomfortable, but if we try this for three months can give their consent, then have a chance to, to speak up after those three months and we can revisit it. And another phrase that's also often used is, uh, is, it, is it good enough for now? And is it safe enough to try? And that still may leave people feeling dissatisfied or uncomfortable. But if if it's good enough for now and it's safe enough to try for you know two weeks, however the amount of time that we determined, then we can give it a whirl and then we can revisit it and potentially change our minds. There's some good questions in the chat, but I'm gonna save save those uh, for our Q and A because I think they would um, work well in that section. So really briefly, um, uh, a, a really important part of what I've learned through being at Quail Springs and sociocracy is about effective meetings. And one really important aspect is speaking in rounds. So this means that each person has an opportunity to speak and we take turns, we go in that circle. Uh, an important element is that the facilitator of the meeting, when we start a round, chooses someone at random because many of us know that often the first person to speak is the person who's used to speaking and the person who has a lot to say. So if we choose someone at random and that person can pass if they like and can come back later, but then we, we're kind of throwing off the, the pattern that can often build in meetings of like, oh, there's that person again. Oh, that person's gonna speak for a long time. And um, the intention of that is to be able to, to hear all voices and again, back to that psychological safety so that people know, okay, I'm going to get to speak. I don't have to elbow my way in here. The facilitator is holding the meeting and can say, okay, thank you for sharing. We're going to hear from someone else. And then another really important practice is not repeating ourselves, which is very tempting to do. If someone says something and we really agree with that, we want to say, oh yeah, I, I also second that. But we don't actually need to do that. It's already been said. We are we are a body that's functioning together as a circle. If someone's already said it, it doesn't need to be repeated. And that's a very unique way of sort of taking the ego out of meetings and also keeping them much more effective and efficient in time. So I'm gonna cruise on. Um, Ashwin can share a little bit with us and I can chip in too if it feels helpful. Um, but a little bit about like some of the, the ongoing learning that we still are engaging in and have to do. Yeah, I mean, I think the bullet points here are succinct enough to tell you what we what we want need to work on. Um, and you had mentioned establishing double links. I think we have sort of an informal double link system in place, but to have truly people designated to go across circles and say, okay, this circle relates to these two circles, and then your job is to tell the facility and operations circle at, uh, about what we're doing and then to tell farm and land stewardship about what we're doing in advocacy circle. And that can still feel a little little uh, clunky at Quail Springs, but we're much better at it than we were a couple of years ago, I will say. Um, and I think I think the best the best way uh, to address this slide and and about continuous growth and improvement is a question that came up. 
um, from Stephen Roberts who said, how do you address situations that have a deadline and yet the group has not reached consent yet? There's mm -hmm. not always a luxury to allow the time for complete non-disagreement. Um, and that's an excellent question because we do face that a lot. And I'm, I'm, so I was just speaking to that we're in this, I'm, I'm in a grant writing process with the deadline tonight at 9 p.m. And there's a lot of aspects of this grant that I have not had the time to speak to multiple teams about. And because I'm working with other organizations on this grant, um, and the timeline was given to me within within two weeks, there was there was also no feasible moment to bring this to the other circles. Everyone's quite busy. However, what is critical in these kind of circumstances is open and transparent communication. And so one of the things that um, we're we're working on, and I think we're pretty good at as an organization, is to tell each other where we might need to take a kind of lead without everyone's input for the sake of something that just needs to get done, uh, because it's an external deadline or it's it's something that um, we're we're requesting the trust of the circles, we're requesting the trust of our co coworkers. Um, with an upfront explanation that there may be things that that I will be necessarily leading us down, but can I have your trust here? This is the basic, this is kind of what I can hand you and give you now, this is what I have to share. I'm gonna need some trust here to move this forward because if we do need to go through the, the entire process, it, we won't get to the deadline in time. So it, you know, the ide ideal scenario is that we are at a place in sociocracy where things are running so efficiently and so smoothly that um, even in these moments of time crunch, there's the right there's the right delegates to talk to, the right double links, the right circles. Um, but you know we're we're human and have so many things that we're juggling, so many so many things on our plate. So we're we often. Um, I wouldn't say we uh, resort back to a hierarchical model. We just um, make sure that what what we're leading is has the trust of our coworkers. Would you say that that's about right, Alex? I would say that's true, and it, and it's a great question because we can't always do this last bullet point. We can't always slow down. Sometimes we need to speed up. You know, the world. What is time? But it has time has a lot of deadlines, <laughs> especially in in work and in organizations, and and infuriatingly and unfortunately, it's where that it depends answer comes in. It's like it depends on what we may set up for our organization. And I'm still learning how to answer your question as well. Um, what I can imagine doing is communicating as clearly as possible with the circles. Say in this in this situation that Ashwin's outlining, in the circles that are affected by what I'm working on, like, hey everybody, I really need to move forward on this. Everyone has a lot going on. Um, I'm going to need to, and this is what I would do in this moment with the information I have. I'm going to need to move forward on some decisions, and I'm going to try to keep everyone as informed as I can. But things are moving fast, and in order to bring in this income, I have to I have to push some things forward. Um, and then keep everyone, this is where business circle is excellent because we have spoken about some of these things this past Tuesday and we will speak about more aspects of what is to come in this grant on the coming Tuesday. But it's it's a really tricky question because sometimes we, we really can't slow down and we then can continue to think of, okay, well maybe there's more effective processes that we can create or like, oh, maybe there's another circle or a sub circle that's just gonna work with this grant and those those few people are just gonna be uh, tightly interwoven in this process. Um, but it's an excellent question. I also have that question and um, probably will continue to for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm excited. I haven't been able to even look at the chat and see any of the questions yet, but um, we, I think Dongyi is kind of writing them down and keeping track. I do want to share a little bit about um, 
one of the major courses that we offer at Quail Springs. So our online permaculture design course is starting very soon. It's starting on May 20th. And one of the reasons we wanted to share today is because we do address a lot of social permaculture aspects in the course. Um, there's, there's, so it's a 24 week course, just to back up a little bit. And it, it provides participants with a lot of tools to be able to apply permaculture concepts, uh, which are concepts from, from all over the world, from all sorts of um, cultures and traditions to their lives to make, to make really distinct and applicable change. And there's a lot of material in this course. If you're particularly interested in sociocracy or in systems design uh, or in capacity building, maybe that's why you joined this webinar, then there's two really great modules uh, in the course. One is taught by Danny Parahansel, who's been involved with Quail Springs for a really long time. He, um, he was a student of Quail Springs, uh, completed his permaculture design course on the land and was a resident for a little bit, um, was on the board for quite a while, is one of the board members who suggested bringing sociocracy to Quail Springs, uh, along with Lexi Spaulding, who's at the very top in the center with the red scarf. I'll give a shout out to Lexi. And um, so Danny Parahansel really gives a lot of information about a canopy view of social design and touches on, on a lot of interesting concepts that we've talked about here today. And there's also another segment module on social design, which covers this transition that Quail Springs made to sociocracy and is also being updated this year with a lot more information of, of how that works and, and how it's going for us and what's working and what we need to improve and what isn't working and what's hard to get to. So, um, and then there's a lot of, if you're interested in agriculture, um, environment, observation, there's so many aspects in this course. Um, Real brief, I'm going to pass it to Dongyi to share more. Dongyi is oversees this whole course, and we want to tell you a little bit more about it. Thank you, Alex. Um, just um, I won't repeat what Alex says, as in the sociocratic circle. <laughs> um, well, the basics of yeah, this course beginning on May twentieth, and um, registration is open at the moment. Uh, you could visit coilsprings.org/pdc to learn um, more about what we offer and who our teachers are, and um, kind of get a little bit of overview about what to expect. Um, we offer um, this online course at a sliding scale. Um, as part of um, the fair share ethics of permaculture to make um, this as accessible as um, we possibly can. Um, we also um, have scholarships and financial aid for folks um, in need, especially um, for BIPOC folks. Um, and this uh, course, is, there is a lot of content, like 30 hours <laughs> of videos and also um, a live interactive part um, and um, you can, uh, we, we use uh, Slack um, where our guest instructors can answer questions on particular sections um, of the PDC. So um, if you're interested and you're working on a particular you know, project, um, there is a chance to um, interact and ask questions and get them answered from our instructors. Um, and I'm gonna post uh, the link to uh, the course. And also if you have any um, questions about this course, um, you can email pdc at coilsprings.org and I'll also drop that in the chat. Um, and I'll turn it, or I, I, I guess I can um, kind of propose the questions that are in the chat if, if this is a good time. Sure, I, I just wanna quickly add to the, uh, to the course, you know, um, if you know, if it's not just you, but you know someone who would like to take this course, it really does make an excellent gift. I think um, there's a lot of people that there's a couple of people I've gifted this course to in my in my life and um, either gifted actually bought the course for them or told them about the, the course and they one of my a couple of my cousins, for example, and they said it's changed their life and changed the way they see the world um and i i 
do believe it brings together the heart of Quail Springs. And part of the reason I think it does that is because all of the funds that we raise from this course are funneled directly into our research and advocacy and outreach work. So you can think about um, signing up this for this course, not only as a way to enrich yourself uh, or your community, but also enrich an underserved part of, of Southern California in the Cuyama Valley, where we do a lot of our work and underserved communities, human communities and non-human communities. Um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful valley where we live, but it's at a precarious situation. Uh, and we are one of the few organizations that is dedicated to it and want to see it thrive and want to see it there for future generations. So um, please think about how this course might not just be the right course for you, but maybe um, a high schooler that you know, or a college student, um, or someone who's just starting a backyard project. I think it's a it's a wonderful way to begin. It's also important to share that um, Quail Springs does is on unceded Chumash land, and we do offer our course for free to any uh, Chumash folks. So that's also please um, spread the word as well about that. Um, feels like an important aspect, and. Yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to answer questions. I'm gonna finally look at the chat and see what we've got. Ashwin, I know you. I know you need to go at six fifteen. But if people, you know, if questions keep rolling, I can always um, stay on for a few more minutes. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, I'll just uh, read one of the questions that I see um, that hasn't been answered <clears throat> from Margaret Wilson. If one circle becomes adamant on their special interests, how would the larger group bring them back to the interest slash survival of the larger group? Becomes adamant on their special interests. So I, I take that to mean that they're moving away from potentially their aims and domain. Might be, can you read it again, Dongyi? Sure. Um, if one circle becomes adamant on their special interests, how would the larger group bring them back to the interests slash survival of the larger group? Mm. Well, I think that's where it's really special that all the circles are interconnected. Um, if there was a challenge happening within a group, if they were sort of straying from the work that they needed to do, or if there were issues within that circle, um, it could be the role of the, the circle lead to then um, go seek assistance from potentially an, another greater, larger circle, or um, to, in our case, uh, at business circle, bring up that potentially something felt misaligned. And then, um, because it, it sort of depends on who's noticing it and and who, uh, wants to bring it up, but I think the the larger circle, which often for us is business circle, um, maybe called executive circle or the top circle, could could be a holder of that space and address um, what may be going, what may be happening with those special interests, and maybe the aims and domain need to be revisited. Maybe they need to um, be rewritten through a proposal, but that whole circle would need to um, be contributing to, to that proposal. And this is where with the double link, someone from, for example, if, if facilities circle was developing special interests, that double link would mean that someone from business circle is in facility circle and they could be um, sharing what's happening for that circle and voting um, equally along with everyone else but holding the, the, the sort of larger picture of the business circle on what may be uh, misaligned in that group. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of different situations that I can imagine, but um, when there's a guiding principle, which is what the aims and domain are, and something starts to develop into a special interest, then there's, then there's a, sort of a pillar to go back to. And, and it's a good question because it's, it has happened. And it, it you know, we're, we're a small organization and, and there are times when, um, I guess out of necessity, we start to think of 
what else can we do to either bring in income to for revenue? Let's say if certain grants, we've applied to all of these grants and they're not coming in um, because it's a particularly competitive cycle, our wheels start turning. Um, but if if we don't have that pillar to return to, we might go too too far astray. And sometimes it's it's happened and we have each other to, to count on as not only within a circle, but within the larger circle to sort of bring us back to center, bring us back to what our, what our mission is, um, since we are a mission-driven organization rather than a profit-driven organization. Um, I will, oh. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Um, I'll read the next question um, from Sai. Um, does consensus base mean majority rule? Consensus actually can mean a lot of different things depending on a group but it it often does require majority rule um but i don't consensus decision making is its is its own whole thing uh means yeah each group kind of interprets it differently but um oh. that is an aspect of it for consent whoop, pardon my my dog making himself known um for consent based decision making uh, we will rework a decision until everyone is on the same page and and truly can give their consent. Okay, it's okay. Um, there is a another question from Sai, which is more personal. How do we stay in touch with Quail Springs uh, and address questions? So Alex and Ashwin. Oh, that's a great question. Well, um, so our website, if you don't know it, is www.quailsprings.org. We're on Facebook as Quail Springs Permaculture. We're on Instagram as quail underscore springs. Um, you, can, you can email us. Um, Admin. Can, Is it yeah, you can, you can either email our names, which you can see on Zoom here. I'm alex at quailsprings.org. And Ashwin is ashwin at quailsprings.org. Or you can, if that's hard to remember, you can email admin at quailsprings.org. And um, we're happy to take the conversation further. And um, we also have uh, farm tours. So if you wanna come see Quail Springs, the farm tours happen once a month and they're starting up soon. So when you go to our website, there's a, a visit page that gives more information about coming to visit us. Also on the website is our news uh, newsletter sign up. So oh, that's yes. an excellent way to just stay uh, abreast of what's happening every couple of months. Um, actually, for many of you on this call, you probably are here because you got our newsletter and saw an invitation in our newsletter to this webinar. Um, and then, oh, thank you. Um, Another question, new question from Stephen. Um, how would you say full consent would differ from unanimous consensus? Ooh. Well, so consensus again deals with agreement. So I think it's maybe a bit of a mindset. Um, and then consent is looking at tending to, to disagreements before being in agreement. So um, there's kind of a, a different feeling behind each of those. And I may, like I mentioned before, I may not be totally behind something personally to give my consent, but I may say, okay, this is good enough to try, um, like safe enough for now, good enough to try. And um, if, if my disagreements have been addressed, then I may be able to give my consent that way. So basically the, de the definition of consent is that no party disagrees. Um, and, and it can take quite a while to get everyone on board to be in consent. I mean, there may be quite a reworking process that happens. Um, there may be people who need to, there are called tuners in sociocracy who may need to take a proposal and tune it. Um, and in the end, a proposal may uh, not pass. It may not receive consent. So I hope I answered your question. Do you have anything to add, Ashwin? No, I think I, I, I was going kind of going along the same lines in that it's 
it's more of even if even if they wrap around to some some kind of a uh, very similar conclusion full con full consent and unanimous consensus the process to by to which or by which they get there is very different um in that there's this encouraging of of i guess it's almost like informed in from from kind of my theoretical background from a negative dialectic like what are the things that are the problems here let's let's really think through all the problems before we can see any kind of solutions and even that solution what problems are behind that solution and keep working through something until we have something that we can move forward with this is fun to see i'm kind of looking back ashwin you already answered it but i appreciate cindy's question what is the range and size of organizations that utilize this method of governance um, and Ashwin answered small and large. I think Toyota is one of the largest companies that runs sociocratically, which is, I'm really glad you asked that Cindy because we were focusing on the small, but actually very large organizations can use sociocracy. And um, I would actually be really interested to intern that one and see how it all works. But these, um, the, the measures can all be applied to any size. Um, so even though we're small, it doesn't mean that soci sociocracy has to stay small. And, and in some ways, I look forward to experiencing a large sociocratic organization because in our current small one, as you can imagine, we're only about 14 people. Many of us sit on so many different circles. Uh, so it'd be interesting to be in an organization where um, one doesn't sit on so many circles. One is sort of sequestered to one or two circles and, and um, yeah, that's that that would be an interesting experiment for me to to see. And is it true, Alex, that Toyota is run sociocratically? I think I remember you telling me that. I yeah, I, I know that they use sociocratic principles. I'm I'm not certain if they're fully sociocratic, but there are some some large corporations that are. Okay. Um I think Japan has really uh taken to sociocracy as well. I uh, really like seeing Jonathan's comment which I want to read to everybody. I was a work trader when Quail Springs started adopting sociocracy. I remember how chaotic it was at start and feeling out of place when attending the meetings but was that was forming the organization, but it was fascinating. Glad to see it's still progressing and doing well. <laughs> well, neither Ashwin nor myself nor Dongyi were there at the time, but I can only imagine. And I, I, I'm so glad that Jonathan wrote that because it's like, yeah, it, things can be, um, there's complicated and there's complex and uh, knowing how many details go into just a small place like Quail Springs and that transition, I can imagine how both complicated and complex it was. But I do feel like we've moved, part of the reason we felt confident in sharing this information is because we feel like we've made great strides and we still have so far to go. But I, I think there's been so much feedback about meetings being more effective, shorter, more focused, us being able to get so much done, the way that we cross communicate. Um, so that's, that's been pretty exciting. And I will wait and see if Dongyi has any more questions to read. Um, I believe that was all the questions. Um, just getting some great comments. Um, one of them from Padma. <laughs> It can be frustrating to work within a team with differing ideas and approaches, but the best way to approach this is to inspire trust. And yeah, I, I feel like um, working at Quail Springs, one of the biggest learnings I'm receiving is like how to work with people and um, really trust in each other. And that like trust is like such a foundation to building. Mm -hmm. um, a healthy society. So thank you for that comment. Yeah, I, I think actually putting the information together for this webinar made me think a lot more about trust, which is not a word that I would use often, but it, it made me realize the ways that actually having a really clear foundation and having clear roles and understandings does inspire trust. And um, so I'm, I'm, thank you, Padma, for saying that because it's it was kind of a breakthrough that I had in thinking about 
what I have learned from sociocracy. And sure, maybe someone will need a little encouragement sometimes to keep up with a certain thing that they're doing or a role or a circle may need a nudge. But ultimately, if, if we know what to expect from each other, then we can relax into some trust, um, which is a pretty special feeling. Well, I, I uh, would like to thank everyone on this call for joining us. Uh, we will eventually get this up on YouTube to share more widely and um, uh, hopefully organize another webinar on governance after a little while to see where we are in maybe another six months or another year. I do have to head out. So I wanted to just quickly pop in to say thank you again to everybody who's, who's joined us today. Yeah, yeah thanks everyone thank so for, much. for being here and for being so engaging. I know we did a lot of talking, but it's great to see your faces and to have you. And I think I'm gonna do what Audrey's doing, take a little nap. <laughs> Bye everyone, thank you for coming. Hi everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, great, it was thank a great you. meeting. Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you were here. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs>